All right, so can you guys just tell me, do you, do you see just the PowerPoint slide or do you see the PowerPoint slide in my notes? And you'll have to tell me because I can't see the comments. I can see both. The notes and the um, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can see both. Let me switch the settings. Hold on one second. Okay, so now do you see a screen with a flower on it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now do you just see the PowerPoint by itself, no notes? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, so this is just a review from your homework question that you guys had for your, so when we are in a residential program, this is part of your homework packet. You have a critical thinking question on the top and then you have your math homework that's on the bottom. Um, but in the online version, the homework question is your post lecture discussion. So that's where this comes from, okay? Um, so it was the question that was talking about the cows and the digestion of cellulose. So a cow, just like humans, does not have the enzyme to break down cellulose. However, a cow's intestinal tract contains compartments that are filled with microorganisms. These microbes do have the special enzyme. So when the cow eats grass or the cellulose, it basically feeds the microbes that are in its intestines. The microbes utilize the cellulose and it produces other digestible molecules for the cows such as glucose, fat, and fatty acids. Therefore, the cow feeds the microbes, and then the microbes feed the cows. And this is what is called a um, called symbiosis or a mutually beneficial relationship. Hold on one second, because someone's logging in, and I have to allow them to, to come in. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's very similar to us, right? We can't digest the cellulose, but we have that normal flora in our colon that helps to digest the cellulose for us. When it breaks down the cellulose, it creates things like glucose and fatty acids, and those things our body can absorb. Ask dad. Dad's on the phone with Adam, but I'm in class, so I can't. Okay. Um, so just FYI, uh, your midterm will include math. This is actually kind of old because we're the the um, medical terminology used to be two separate courses. You had prereqs, and then you also had um, the medical terminology portion of the class. So this is kind of I've been teaching this class a while. This is an old slide. Just know your midterm does include math. There's a separate midterm now for your medical terminology. That's part of your class and it's under the midterm tab, which you, you can't see just yet because it's not time for the midterm, but it'll be located underneath the um, that tab. Just ignore the rest about the medical terminology. Your final will have math and it will also have medical terminology as well. Um, so you need to remember too that to, in order to move forward in the core program, um, you have to uh, have an 80% or higher to move forward. Um, also, if I send you emails in Jeji, you want to make sure that you do not unsubscribe or click here because if you do, you're going to miss emails because if you look right here, it says category. I have to pick a category when I'm emailing you guys. So if I if I sent something under education and you unsubscribe from that, and then the next time I send an email, I send it under education again, you're not going to get that email. Now, if you happen to already unsubscribe, it's okay. You can go into Judgy. You can go into your um, email settings and you can just click the little box that's for education and resubscribe. Um, so if you need help with that, you can ask me um, at a separate time and I'll help you with that issue. But please make sure you do not unsubscribe from that section. And it will not just affect your medical terminology or excuse me, your prereq class. It'll affect all your classes moving forward into the core because any instructor could pick that category and you've now been um, unsubscribed.
Sorry, hold on, a student's having issues. Okay, so we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the lecture now. Um, so we should be on lecture four, correct? Because we did three last last class. Um, so we left a we left off at the very end where we we're talking about genes and then DNA and then chromosomes. So it's kind of picking up from there. So nucleic acids, those are things like DNA and RNA. So you guys have probably heard of DNA before. We talked a little bit about how that is the recipe for um, anything that our body does. Um, and so um, it's the blueprint or it provides uh, the information that's needed and it tells our body what to do. Um, so if something gets messed up, then that gene is not going to function correctly. And if you remember from before, one gene or one protein or one gene codes for one protein. Um, so RNA um, is a little bit different than DNA. Um, we're going to find all this out as we go through uh, the different uh, components that make up RNA and DNA. So RNA monomers, so remember monomers, the smallest unit, are composed of three parts. So it's composed of a phosphate group, which is this right here. And then also it's composed of a ribose, which is right here. And it's also composed of a nucleic base, which is right here. So all three of those make up a monomer. All, th all three of those um, molecules or compounds make up that monomer. Um, and so there's four different types of these bases right here for RNA, okay? And if you look right here, it tells you that the, um, that the nucleic bases can be adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. So uracil is, is unique. It's only found in RNA, okay? So that kind of separates it from DNA, is that um, the nucleic base, so It'll have similar nucleic bases like adenine, guanine, and cytosine because DNA has those as well. But the one thing that is different is this uracil, okay? DNA will not have uracil. Um, so the ribose right here, anything that ends in os and tells you that it's a sugar, right? Like glucose, cellulose, galactose, right? Ribose. So the end of it tells us that it is a sugar and it's the central sugar that make up, um, that makes up RNA. And the way that I remember that, that ribose is specific to RNA is that it starts with R and so does RNA. RNA starts with R as well. So ribose is that sugar. And then you need to remember to the bases that are included for RNA, which are adenine, guanine, cytosine. But the one thing that's specific to RNA is the uracil. You're only going to find that in the RNA. Um, so DNA monomers are composed of three parts as well. So it too has a phosphate group. It too has a phosphate. And it also has a central sugar, and it also has a nitrogenous base, which is the same thing as a, this is the same thing as a nucleic base, which is the term that they used on the last slide. It's the same thing. But you'll notice that um, the DNA, its sugar starts with a D, deoxyribose, and that's the sugar. So DNA stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. RNA stands for ribose nucleic acid. So that's how you can determine which one is which. So deoxyribose is the central sugar for the DNA. And then there's four types of nucleic bases. And remember I told you both RNA and DNA have adenine, guanine, and cyanine, or excuse me, cytosine. But the one thing that's different from DNA and RNA is that instead of uracil, it has thymine, okay? Thank you. 
Um, so here's examples that we just went through. So the monomers for the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA are called nucleotides. That's what the monomers are called. So both RNA and DNA are nucleotides. So when they're put together in a chain, they make up polymers. So those nucleotides will make up polymers, which are the RNA and the DNA. So the nucleotide monomers will have three parts. It'll have a phosphate group. Both of them had a phosphate group. It'll have a central sugar, but the central sugar will, will be different depending on if it's RNA and DNA, right? So if it's RNA, it'll have ribose. And if it's DNA, it'll have deoxyribose. And then it'll have the nucleic bases. And remember, some of the bases are the same, right? Like adenine, guanine, and cytosine are the same on both of these, right? It, the only thing that's different is that in RNA, it has uracil, and in DNA, it has thymine, okay? We're not gonna give you a picture and you're not gonna have to label things but you do need to know the differences um, that make up the specifics of DNA versus RNA, what makes them different and what makes them similar and what makes them unique from each other. So here's a little memory aid to help you remember. So RNA, so RNA has uracil and then DNA, DNA has thymine. So you could say RU and then so right, ribose and uracil, and DT would be DNA and thymine. So while adenine, guanine, and cytosine are common for both RNA and DNA, uracil will only be found in RNA, and thymine will only be found in the DNA. Um, so when these monomers are put into polymeric chains, the point of the attachment is between the nucleotides and between the phosphate group of the central sugar. So if you remember, you know, this is that central sugar, right? So it's attached from that phosphate to that, oops, sorry guys, that phosphate to that central sugar. Same thing over here from the phosphate to the central sugar. So from the phosphate to the central sugar, phosphate to central sugar. So that it's going to be the same both for ribose um, and all, or excuse me, the RNA and also the DNA. So each one of these little um, letters represent the name of what the nucleic base is. So C stands for cytosine, A is adenine, U is uracil, G is guanine, right? So remember uracil is very specific to um, the RNA. Over here, the DNA, the A is adenine, aden uh, I can't even talk, adenine and then thymine and cytosine. Remember, thymine is very um, specific to DNA. Um, so now let's talk a little bit more about the differences between DNA and RNA. So DNA is the original code and it always stays inside the cell's nucleus, right? So if you remember, um, when we studied about the cell, you have the cell and then you have the nucleus. So the DNA is found inside this nucleus and it's kept inside there because it needs to be protected um, because it is the original code. Just like um, the Declaration of Independence or the Mona Lisa, it's kept in a very safe place so that it can't be damaged or destroyed. Um, so the other thing that's um, specific to DNA is that it's double stranded. So there's one strand right here and then there's a second strand right here, right? So, um, oops. So this would be the first strand right here, okay? And then the second strand would be right here. So it's kind of twisted around in a double helix, right? Which we, we learned about the alpha helix, right? That's a protein and it's the secondary stage of a protein, right? And then, uh, so it kind of takes that shape. So DNA is a form of a protein. Right? And uh, we have to remember that on these strands, one of the strands is the original code and the other one is the complementary code. So, um, the complementary is the second strand of DNA that attaches to the primary one similarly to the way two sides of a zipper attach to each other. Uh, one strand matches the other due to its hydrogen bonds. So there's hydrogen bonds that, um, uh, that are found in between these right here that hold the, the double and the single strand together. Um, and, and it's the complementary nucleotides 
uh, that are attracted to each other. So that's going to make sense to you in a minute because we're going to talk about the complementary uh, nucleotides in just a minute. So RNA is very different because it's a copy of the genetic code and it's a single stranded. Okay, so remember DNA is the original code and it's double stranded. Okay, any questions before I move on? This is an example right here of RNA. You can see it's single stranded right here. Okay, so review, DNA is double-stranded. It has an original code and it has a complementary code. This is where we're gonna talk about the nucleotides and their complementary pairs. So adenine and, <clears throat> excuse me, adenine and thymine are best friends. They like to hang out. They don't wanna hang around anybody else but their best friends. So you can see right here. So if there's an adenine on the original strand, the complementary strand would have thymine. And if thymine was on the original strand, then the complementary nucleotide would be adenine. And then the same thing for cytosine and guanine. They're only gonna hang out with each other. So adenine will never hang out with cytosine and thymine will never hang out with guanine and vice versa because they only wanna hang around their buddies, okay? Remember the bonds between these uh, pairs are hydrogen bonds. So if you look specifically at this structure right here, okay, the blue represents cytosine right here, right? And the yellow represents guanine, okay? The cytosine and the guanine are held together right here by hydrogen bonds. And it's that way through all the complementary nucleotides. Like even right here, we have adenine and thymine and there's still a hydrogen bond here that holds them together. But if you look at this DNA strand right here, you'll notice that they're always hanging out with their best friends. They're not hanging out with anyone different. Okay, so again, here's the complementary strands for the DNA, adenine and thymine, thymine and adenine, or cytosine and guanine, or guanine and cytosine. So the A's on the one strand match up with the T's on the matching strand, and the C's on the strand match the G's on the other strand. So one strand matches the other due to those hydrogen bonds that are formed between the complementing nucleotides. So complementing nucleotides, this is talking about the best friends, right? These are the complementary nucleotides because they only want to hang out with what complements them, and that's their best friend. Okay, so here's the summary of differences between RNA and DNA. So the central sugar for RNA is ribose, and we can remember that because that's what the R stands for in RNA. And the DNA is deoxyribose for its central sugar, and we know that because deoxyribose is the first part of DNA, it stands for deoxyribose nucleic acid. And then the nucleic bases are gonna be adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil, because that's very different compared to DNA. For the nucleic bases in DNA, it's gonna be adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And with uh, the genetic codes on this side, this is a, cop a copy, right? And this right here is the original code. Um, so the DNA strands are single for RNA and then they're double for uh, DNA, okay? Any questions so far? Okay, so um, DNA is double-stranded where complementary strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. The complementing nucleotide pairs are adenine and thymine, and they form two hydrogen bonds with each other, and C and G, and they form three hydrogen bonds with each other. I don't want you to stress about, ooh, sorry. Don't worry about this, okay? <laughs> the only reason you would need to know that is if really you're working with, uh, if you're doing like, um, taking a pathophysiology class or a biochemistry class um, because there's something called a two prime and a three prime, but you're not gonna need to know that for this class. So I don't want you to stress about memorizing that, okay? Um, so DNA is wound into a helix. It's a double helix because DNA is double stranded and its structure resembles a winding staircase and all of DNA is separated into sections that are called chromosomes. So remember, a bunch of genes, right? So genes, genes make up 
uh, DNA and DNA make up the chromosomes, okay? From biggest to smallest, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna see if I'm able to show this video to you. Nope. Discard. This little light. So just curious. Can you guys see the YouTube video on your screen right now? If someone can just let me know. Yeah. Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. I'm gonna let it. It's just beautiful, isn't it? It's it's just it's it's mesmerizing. It's it's double helix sighting. You really can tell just by looking at it how sort of important and amazing it is. It's pretty much the most complicated molecule that exists, and potentially the most important one. It's so complex that we didn't even know for sure what it looked like until about 60 years ago. It's so multifariously awesome that if you took all of it from just one of our cells and untangled it. It would be taller than me. Now consider that there are probably 50 trillion cells in my body right now. Laid end to end, the DNA in those cells would stretch to the sun, not once, but 600 times. Mind blown yet? Hey, you want to make one? <laughs> Of course, you know, I'm talking about deoxyribonucleic acid, known to its friends as DNA. DNA is what stores our genetic instructions, the information that programs all of our cells' activities. It's a six billion letter code that provides the assembly instructions for everything that you are. And it does the same thing for pretty much every other living thing. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume that you are a human, in which case every body cell that you have or somatic cell in you has 46 chromosomes, each containing one big DNA molecule. These chromosomes are packed together tightly with proteins in the nucleus of the cell. DNA is nucleic acid, and so is its cousin, which we'll also be talking about, ribonucleic acid, or RNA. Now, if you can uh, make your mind do this, remember all the way back to episode three, where we talked about all the important biological molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Now, ring a bell. Well, nucleic acids are the fourth major group of biological molecules, and for my money, they have the most complicated job of all. Structurally, they're polymers, which means that each one is made up of many small repeating molecular units. In DNA, these small units are called nucleotides. Link them together and you have yourself a polynucleotide. Now, before we actually put these tiny parts together to build a DNA molecule, like some microscopic piece of Ikea furniture, let's first take a look at what makes up each nucleotide. We're gonna need three things. One, a five carbon sugar molecule, two, a phosphate group, and three, one of four nitrogen bases. DNA gets the first part of its name from our our first ingredient, the sugar molecule, which is called deoxyribose. But all the really significant stuff, the genetic coding that makes you you, is found among the four nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's important to note that in living organisms, DNA doesn't exist as a single polynucleotide molecule, but rather a pair of molecules that are held tightly together. They're like an intertwined microscopic double spiral staircase, basically just a ladder, but twisted, the famous double helix. And like any good structure, we have to have have a main support. In DNA, the sugars and phosphates bond together to form twin backbones. These sugar phosphate bonds run down each side of the helix, but chemically in opposite directions. In other words, if you look at each of the sugar phosphate backbones, you'll see that one appears to be upside down in relation to the other. One strand begins at the top of the first phosphate connected to the sugar molecule's fifth carbon, and then ending where the next phosphate would go with a free end at the sugar's third carbon. Again, he's going to talk about five prime, three prime, and I don't want you to stress about knowing that. Okay. Carbon. This creates a pattern called five prime and three prime. I've always thought the oxyribose with an arrow with the oxygen as a point. It always points 
from three prime to five prime. Now on the other strand, it's exactly the opposite. It begins up top with a free end at the sugar's third carbon, and the phosphates connect to the sugar's fifth carbons all the way down. And it ends at the bottom with the phosphate, and you've probably figured this out already, but this is called the three prime to five prime direction. Now it is time to make ourselves one of these famous double helices. These two long chains are linked together by the nitrogenous bases via relatively weak hydrogen bonds, but they can't be just any pair of nitrogenous bases. Thankfully, when it comes to figuring out what part goes where, all you have to do is remember that if one nucleotide has an adenine base, only thymine can be its counterpart. Likewise, guanine can only bond with cytosine. These Bonded nitrogenous bases are called base pairs. The GC pairing has three hydrogen bonds, making it slightly stronger than the AT base pair, which only has two. It's the order of these four nucleobases, or the base sequence, that allows your DNA to create you. So AGGTCCATG means something completely different as a base sequence than, say, TTCAGTCG. Human chromosome 1, the largest of all of our chromosomes, contains a single molecule of DNA with 247 million base pairs. If you printed all of the letters of chromosome 1 into a book, it would be about 200,000 pages long. And each of your somatic cells has 46 DNA molecules tightly packed into its nucleus. That's one for each of your chromosomes. Put all 46 molecules together and we're talking about roughly 6 billion base pairs in every cell. This is the longest book that I've ever read. It's about a thousand pages long. If we were to fill it with our DNA sequence, we'd need about 10,000 of them to fit our entire genome. Pop quiz! Let's test your skills using a very short strand of DNA. I'll give you one base sequence, you give me the base sequence that appears on the other strand. Okay, here goes. So we got a five prime AGGTCC. I'm gonna pause it just for a second because he goes really fast. So what he's asking you to do is to fi find out what the base pairs would be for that. So if you had adenine, right, then we would see that it would pair up with thymine, right? Guanine would pair up with cytosine. So if, right here, guanine would, would pair up with uh, cytosine. Thymine would pair up with adenine. Cytosine would pair up with guanine. Cytosine would pair up with guanine. And guanine would pair up with cytosine. Because he goes really fast. If I don't pause it, you won't get three it. Three prime <laughs> and and time's up. The answer is 3 prime TCC AGGC 5 prime. See how that works? It's not super complicated. Since each nitrogenous base only has one counterpart, you can use one base sequence to predict what its matching sequence is going to look like. So, could I make the same base sequence with a strand of that other nucleic acid, RNA? No, you could not. RNA is certainly similar to its cousin DNA. It has a sugar phosphate backbone with nucleotide bases attached to it, but there are three major differences. One, RNA is a single-stranded molecule, no double helix here. Two, the sugar in RNA is ribose, which has one more oxygen atom than deoxyribose, hence the whole starting with an R instead of a D thing. And finally, RNA does not contain thymine. Its fourth nucleotide is the base uracil, so it bonds with adenine instead. RNA is super important to the production of our proteins, and you'll see later that it has a crucial role in the replication of DNA. But first, Okay, so we're going to stop there. <clears throat> and then before we go to page seven, we're going to do our practice questions. Um, so at the top of page six, that's an important uh, chart for you to memorize because it tells you the differences between the RNA and the DNA. Okay, um, so practice question one says nucleotides and RNA do not include. Um, so we know RNA does have a phosphate group, um, and it doesn't have deoxyribose, right? It has ribose, which is why it starts with an R. Um, so the answer would be B, because we're looking for the false statement. Uh, number two is the difference between DNA and RNA is... Um, and so the answer would be D, that DNA is double-stranded while RNA is uh, single-stranded. Three would be the matching strands of DNA are held together by, and it would be C, hydrogen bonds. Okay. 
So the functions of the nucleic acid. So the contents of the nucleus or the DNA are divided into sections called chromosomes. So the human DNA library consists of 46 chromosomes. So the way I liken this is that the, the cell is the town in which you live in and the nucleus is the library. And when you go to the library and you're trying to look for a book, it's, it's very specific as to where they would they put those books, right? There's different sections. Um, there's, you know, uh, fiction, there's nonfiction, there's reference material, there's a science section. They have all these different sections. Um, well, our DNA is kind of divided up that way too. It's divided into very specific sections. Um, and each of those sections contains a book or it contains genes, right? So there's many books in these sections. So those books would represent the gene that has the information needed or the recipe needed for everything that our body does, okay? So each one of those is found on those sections in the library. Those sections are called chromosomes, okay? So those genes are found on the chromosomes. The chromosomes are found in the library or the nucleus, okay? Um, so each chromosome contains many genes, and a gene is a portion of a chromosome, like a book in the library that contains a recipe for making a specific type of protein. So each gene or book in, in the recipe tells the body how to make one protein, which we learned last week. So if we need a recipe on how to make a protein, we need to. So many of you are too young to remember having to actually go to the library and research for your papers, okay? You have the handy dandy World Wide Web. I'm as old as the dinosaurs. We did not have the World Wide Web when I wanted to do a report. I literally had to find time from my busy schedule to go to the library and I would have to look at the books in the library because a lot of books that are reference books cannot be checked out and taken outside of the library. If I needed to take that information with me, we had to do a Xerox where we would copy the information, kind of similar to how copy machine copies the pages on the book. And so we could take that copy with us outside of the library, but we couldn't take that recipe or that book outside the library. It's the same thing here. We cannot take the DNA out of the library or the nucleus. It has to stay inside the nucleus where it's protected. However, I can take a copy outside of the nucleus. And um, so it works kind of similar, okay? So we go to the DNA library or the nucleus, we find the right section or the chromosomes, and then we find the book with the recipes we need, which is the gene, and then we copy that recipe to make a messenger RNA. And then we take that copy of the messenger RNA out of the library with us, okay? So we can only take the copy cannot take the original code. Okay, so remember that one a copy of one gene or one book is one messenger RNA, because remember RNA is the copy of the DNA, okay? So transcription is the process of copying, so it's the process of copying a gene to make one messenger RNA. It literally means rewriting, okay? So if we couldn't take a copy of the reference book from the library, we had to write it down by hand, okay? Now, I'm rewriting what was in the books because I can't take that book outside of the library, okay? This, this gene or this DNA cannot be taken outside of the library. The body has to rewrite it. Now, if I accidentally rewrite something wrong, or I trans, or I trans, uh, or I'm rewriting the material, but I leave something out, I may not have the accurate information when I leave the library. So the same thing here. When we're doing transcription, if our body copies the DNA wrong, then we're going to take that messenger RNA that has bad information out of the library and it's going to be inaccurate. So outside the nucleus, the messenger RNA is caught up by tiny cell organelles that are called ribosomes. So ribosomes 
read the messenger RNA sequence and it translates it. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, the information that you took is um, very complicated, right? In the res the in the reference book that you had in the library, and now you're taking it to somebody else who's kind of going to break it down into simple terms for you. So they're going to translate mm -hmm. that information into the amino acid sequence. So remember, the amino acid sequence has to be very specific in the way that it's ordered or it will mess up that whole protein because it will change its shape. So if the pattern of the amino acids was translated incorrectly, then it will be put together inaccurate and that will change the shape of the protein and then the protein will no longer be able to perform its function because it's going to, it's, it's going to eventually take that three-dimensional shape, but if the amino acid sequence is um, not translated correctly, then the shape is going to change. Okay, so does anyone have questions on that before I move to the next slide? Okay, um, so this, let me see, hold on, before we move. So this is just giving you an example on how things would be translated, okay? Mm -hmm. So this right here is the uh, original strand of the DNA, okay? And this right here is the copy, right? So if this is the original, remember the complementary pairs have to stick together. So thymine would be with adenine, cytosine would be with guanine, and so forth, okay? This right here represents the messenger RNA. So it's going to copy this original strand right here. But remember that it doesn't have thymine. Instead, it's going to have uracil. So for every T, that's going to be changed to uracil for the messenger RNA. Okay, so um, we have to, this is the copy, right, that it's going down here. So T is a U, C, C, A, A. So just know that the T's are being replaced with U's here. Then... This sequence right here is going to be translated because eventually it has to go back into um, the proper shape in order for it to be useful. So this is the rewriting stage, right? The transcription where we're rewriting this original strand, <clears throat> this original strand right here, okay? We rewrote it this way, but now we have to take it somewhere and get it translated into the information that we can use, okay? So transcription, remember, means to rewrite the primary strand of the DNA, and translation means to read the DNA and translate it into the amino acid sequence. So this is the amino acid sequence right here. Okay, so um, let's do our practice questions on page eight. It says the entire DNA library in the cell nucleus is divided into sections that are called, and it should be chromosomes. And then it says the process of copying a single gene from the DNA library yields, and it should be a messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. Reading the sequence of nucleotides and decoding it into the sequence of amino acids that will make up a new protein is called translation. All right, any questions on that material before we move on to the next material? Okay, so I'm assuming, oops, I'm assuming silence is a good sign. No news is good news, okay? I have a, I, I have a question. Uh-huh. Can you go back to the other slide where you showed um, when it turns in, translates into the T's translate to use or mm -hmm. yourself? Then you have it going into the peptide chain. How mm -hmm. are, we, are we supposed to know what those turn into as well to make you up that you just need to know that the what's being rewritten is translate, translated into a specific amino acid sequence. Remember how the primary structure, the protein, they have to have a specific sequence? That's all you need to know. You don't need to know what the name of those amino acids are. That's what this okay. is. These are names of amino acids. Yeah, that was my question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so these right here, these are amino acids. So you don't have to memorize what, 
which amino acids are which there's lots of them so you just need to know that when you're this is where we're rewriting and then this is where it's translated into the amino acids here all right so um gene expression um is it okay to go on everyone's got it now before i move to the next section where did, what are you doing did it take it downstairs? no you can sit right there and do your schoolwork though okay so the gene expression is is the entire um process including gene transcription and translation to the moment of activation by the golgi apparatus so changes in the dna sequence even the slightest ones can bring about serious consequences if you have a ruined gene, it will get transcribed into a ruined messenger RNA, and it will get translated into a ruined protein. Liam, Liam, you need to go out. No, go out. Okay, sorry. Um, so mutations, these would be spontaneous changes in DNA. So they just happen as a fluke. The information either gets transcribed transcribed wrong or gets translated wrong okay and there's also something called point mutations so this is where there's a change in just a single nucleotide in the dna sequence so um a point mutations are harmless and they do not cause serious problems but sometimes they can ruin the whole gene so when such a mutant gene gets passed on to offspring then that's when we call it a genetic disorder. So for example, cystic fibrosis, right? That's a genetic disorder resulting in a dysfunctional enzyme that has difficulty in breaking down mucus. So we have an enzyme that helps to break down the mucus in our body. And without it, the mucus becomes very viscous, which means thick mm -hmm. and hard to clear out. And so their lungs or their little alveoli that are in our lungs um, will have uh, blockages and so gas exchange can be an issue. Also, we have mucous membranes in our nose and in our stomach and in our reproductive tracts and that, that mucus gets very thick there so it affects our digestion and it can even affect our, um, our uh, fertility or our reproduction. Um, there's another uh, genetic defect called PKU, which is phenylketoconuria. So this is um, a disease or a genetic disorder that we check for when a baby is born. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the newborn screenings. It's a very rare disorder that causes the amino acids in phenylalanine. So phenylalanine is, is an amino acid to build up in the body and the defect in the gene that helps to create the enzyme that's needed to break it down. So without the enzyme, there's this dangerous buildup that develops in foods that are high in protein. So um, this can lead to serious health problems. So we check this early on when babies are born because we wanna catch it early before it causes damage to the body. So they have to be on a very specific formula and a specific diet. They can't consume a lot of proteins because their bodies can't break it down. And they can't drink certain things like um, certain diet drinks have phenylalanine in it. And so they can't drink things like that because it'll be very damaging to their body. It can cause intellectual disabilities. It can also affect their behavior, it can affect their emotion, and it can also affect um, them neurologically. So you're not going to have to memorize the cystic fibrosis thing or the PKU thing. I'm just relating it so that it makes sense to you uh, when we're talking about point mutations and mutations. Um, so now we're going to talk about ATP. So you will recall that nucleotides, the monomers of DNA and RNA, are made up of a phosphate group, a ribose molecule in the center, and a nucleic base. Um, if instead of the three components, we add only a nucleic base, so we're talking adenine and ribose, right? So if you remembered um, when we were talking, ah, when we were talking about DNA, right there was a phosphate and then there was a sugar right a sugar here a phosphate and then they had a new nu a nucleic base can't even read my writing there then you had a nucleic base right that was dna and then rna it had a phosphate right and then it had a sugar 
and then it had a nucleic base. So what they're saying is if you just take the ribose, right, the ribose, and then the adenine, which is a nucleic base, okay, um, then you get adenosine, okay? So this right here is adenosine, okay? Not this, not this, just this right here, okay? So if we attach this adenosine molecule to the phosphate group, the resulting molecule will be the nucleotide adenosine monophosphate. So now if I attach this to the phosphate, okay, now we have adenosine mono. Mono means one, right? So there's one phosphate here. So that's why it's adenosine monophosphate, okay? Then if I have two uh, phosphates, the sugar and the adenosine, then I have adenosine di, because di means two, diphosphate, two phosphates, okay? And finally, if we add the third phosphate, so we have a phosphate, a phosphate, and a phosphate, then we have the sugar, and then we have the adenine. Now we have adenosine triphosphate, okay? So again, if, if it was just with the one right here, then it's adenosine, okay? Um, if you, or excuse me, if it's, let me go back, okay? If it's just this ribose right here and this adenine, it's adenosine, okay? Then if we add one phosphate, we have adenosine monophosphate. Go out. Sorry, guys, hold on. Sorry, I locked my door, so he'll quit coming in here. Okay, so adenosine monophosphate, there's now one phosphate, and mono means one, okay? With the green, right, now we have two phosphates. So then that's adenosine diphosphate. Then if we add three, we have adenosine triphosphate. So there's three uh, phosphates that are included. All right, any questions on this one so far? Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so the bond between the second and the third phosphate group in an ATP molecule is the high energy bond. So the energy in a chemical form, because remember we learned there's different types of energy forms like light, chemical, um, friction, all kinds of fun stuff, heat. So when this bond is broken, a lot of energy is released. So they're talking about this right here, this bond in between this second and third phosphate. If I were to, to break off this phosphate and it was over here by itself, a lot of energy happens when I do that, okay? Um, and so when this bond is broken, a lot of energy is released. Every cell in the body makes these ATP and uses them when necessary by breaking off the third phosphate group to release the energy that is trapped in a chemical bond. And the following diagram shows how it's worked. So here we started with our adenosine triphosphate, right? We're gonna break off this phosphate here. Then a lot of energy is being released right here. And then we end up with a phosphate over here by itself. So this was adenosine triphosphate, right? But now we have a phosphate by itself and then we have adenosine diphosphate, right? Because there's two phosphates here. 
So when the body cells don't make the whole ATP from, or excuse me, the body cells do not make the whole ATP molecule from scratch every time. So when an ATP molecule is used up, it's turned into adenosine diphosphate because it has two phosphates plus a separate phosphate group. And it can be restored back to ATP. So it's like a battery, right? A rechargeable battery where I'm going to release this over here by itself create a lot of energy but eventually I can take this molecule and just add or recharge the energy by eating something right that contains phosphates in it and that phosphate can attach back to that adenosine diphosphate and make adenosine triphosphate and then it's ready to be used again to create more energy. So ATP is like a rechargeable battery. It's easily restored or recharged by reattaching the phosphate group back onto the ADP molecule. However, to recharge this battery, energy is needed from somewhere else so it can be put into the energy of ATP. So that is why we need to eat, right? We need to eat. That's where we're gonna get that energy from. So even though food tastes good, right? Really, we're, we're only supposed to be eating food to create the energy needed to perform our bodily functions every day. So when we eat food molecules, we break down those molecules to extract the chemical energy that's trapped in them. Then we put them back, that we put the energy into recharging the ATP batteries so that we can use those ATPs over and over again. And this is what we, um, we excuse me, so that we can use those ATPs over and over again like this. Right, so we started with our ATP. We're gonna break off that phosphate right here. And when we do that, we're creating a lot of energy, right? Then we're gonna eat food so we can add that phosphate back on. And now we're gonna have ATP again. And we can just keep doing this cycle over and over again. Um, so before we move on to this section, on page 11, it's important that you understand what's being summarized down there. So this is in relationship to this, uh, this one right here. Let me see if I can erase. Okay, so it says adenine is attached to the ribose. So if ad adenine, if adenine is attached to the ribose, so basically I just have this right now, right? Then that's adenosine, okay? If I take an adenine and a ribose and a phosphate, then I have adenosine monophosphate. Or if I take adenosine and a phosphate, I have adenosine monophosphate. So you have to watch in the lecture because it might tell you if you take an adenine and a ribose and a phosphate that creates adenosine monophosphate. Or it might tell you if you take an ad adenosine and a phosphate, you get ad you get uh, the adenosine monophosphate. Okay, so is anyone confused where I'm coming from right now or does everyone understand? Okay. Um, okay. So, so added um, adenosine, right? No, Adenosine is made up of two things. It's made up of a ribose and a nucleic base, adenine. Okay. Adenosine is still made up of, uh, or excuse me, the adenosine monophosphate is still made up of an adenosine and one phosphate. Or, Instead of saying it's adenosine, which is made up of a ribose and an adenine, it's made up of three things, right? Adenine, ribose, so adenine, ribose, and a phosphate. So there's two ways to say it. You could say that it's a ribose and an adenine and a phosphate, or you could say it's adenosine and a phosphate that make up this monophosphate. Do you get it now? Are you still struggling? Okay. Uh huh. And so the same thing happens with each one below it, right? Yeah. You can say the same yeah, thing for you. for the um, adenosine diphosphate, right? 
the lecture, the question might say, if I take a ribose and an adenine and then two phosphates, does that make up adenosine diphosphate? True or false? The answer would be true, right? Because we have an adenine, a ribose, we have an adenine, a ribose, and two phosphates here, okay? But it would also be true to say, instead of having the ribose and adenine, that we would say that adenosine plus two phosphates also makes up the adenosine diphosphate. And then the same thing down here. If I have three phosphates, a ribose and an, aden and an adenine, that still makes up adenosine triphosphate, or I can say adenosine plus three phosphates e equals the adenosine triphosphate, because there is a question where it's gonna say something like that, and you're gonna, you're gonna need to be able to um, answer that question appropriately. So this is for people that like pictures, right? If you're a verbal person, it also talks about it too. In the summary, it says adenine attached to ribose is adenosine. Adenine attached to a ribose. So adenine that's attached to a ribose is still adenosine, right? So adenine attached to a ribose plus one phosphate group is adenosine monophosphate. Or you could, you could write, um, I don't have the picture. I guess I don't have that lecture part in my, um, in my book, but you could write where it says adenosine attached to a ribose and one phosphate group is adenosine monophosphate. In that little space underneath it, you could write adenosine plus one phosphate equals adenosine monophosphate. So, um, then, like if you were to say like adenosine plus two phosphates, that's going to be the triphosphate, right? If there's two phosphates, it's diphosphate. But since adenosine already has one, wouldn't it be? No, adenosine doesn't have a phosphate. Adenosine is just the ribose and adenine. Oh, okay. See right here? It's just, so adenosine right here is just the ribose and the adenine. That's what adenosine is. There's no phosphate. When you add the phosphate, then it changes it to adenosine monophosphate. So it depends on how many phosphates you have, right? With the ribose and the adenine, or you can just say adenosine, which is the ribose and the adenine. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Um, any more questions before I move on to the next slide? So just to show you what I'm kind of talking about here, right? If we if we didn't have this here, okay, this is a ribose and this is adenine. That's adenosine. These things together equal adenosine, okay? Now that I add two phosphates, it's, a, it's adenosine diphosphate. Here, this right here is a ribose and an adenine, right? So a ribose plus adenine equals adenosine, right? So also, if I were to add two phosphates, then I have, or excuse me, three phosphates, then I have adenosine triphosphate. Or I have adenosine plus three phosphates equals adenosine triphosphate. So just different ways of writing it, but it's the same thing. It's kind of like saying, it's kind of like saying five plus five equals 10, 
or 5 plus 2 plus 3 equals 10. It's still the same thing. It's just you're using different structures to, to make it up, or you're breaking it down into smaller components to make up the same thing. Okay, so um, ATP, we talked about being like a rechargeable battery. Once it's discharged, so we remove the phosphate here, we can eat food, and we will create the adenosine triphosphate again. Okay, so we have practice questions on one. So number one says the high energy bond of the ATP molecule is, and it should be, excuse me, between the second and the third phosphate. So if ATP is like a rechargeable battery, when it's discharged, it becomes ADP, right? So when we, <clears throat> when we discharge, meaning that we release this, we release this energy right here, this is being removed. So now we have ADP left. Okay, um, so human tissue cells recharge ATP using energy of, and it should be C, food. Okay, so psychological health, we learned a little bit about this before. So Abram Maslow, he was a famous psychologist. Um, and he had a theory that our needs must be fulfilled starting from the bottom of his pyramid to the top. So the bottom, the portion that is down here, the portion that is down here, these are our most fundamental survival needs, our basic biological needs, right? We need food, we need water, we need warmth, and we need to be able to sleep. We have to have those things in order to be whole, okay? So once we meet what's down here, right, then we can move up the pyramid to address other concerns like safety needs. Um, so once the levels needs are met, you look at the next need on the hierarchy. So you must provide the patients with the needs based on this hierarchy. For example, right, if you're working in the emergency room and someone's having a severe asthma attack and they can't breathe, and, but you notice there's bruises all over their body and um, the husband won't leave the wife alone. You're not gonna be like, is your husband beating you? That's not the first thing that you're gonna address. The first thing you're gonna address is her oxygen issue because she can't breathe. And she's not gonna care whether she feels safe at home right now because she can't breathe. She just wants to breathe. So we have to address those things first. Then we could address safety needs, right? Um, and then once they feel safe and secure, then we can work on the belongingness and love needs, you know, forming intimate relationships or having friends. Um, then esteem needs like prestige or feeling of accomplishment, how they feel about themselves. And the self-actualization is one achieving a full potential, including creative activities. So when we are answering questions in, in NCLEX, it is important to make sure the patient is safe, right? But we have to address the basic ABCs, right? Your airway, breathing, circulation first. And then we address um, the other biological functions before we move up to the next one, which would be safety. Um, so when you're, like I'm saying, there's two correct answers if you were to ask about safety or ask about psychological needs but you would have to address those basic needs first before you can um, before you can uh, move up the hierarchy of the pyramid. Okay. Any questions on that before we move on? So um, the reason we have to know about that Maslow's is because when we have questions in nursing and the NCLEX, there's usually two right answers. You have to prioritize your care in nursing so you can take care of the most severe first. <clears throat> so on page 15, it does talk about um, Maslow's. So out of all of the psychological stuff, even though it says it's uh, not mandatory to read, it's an optional topic, you do need to know about Maslow's. So make sure you read about Maslow's. Okay, so diseases. We're gonna talk about different disease categories. 
Um, do you guys want to take a break really quick before we go into this, or do you want to just keep going forward? All right, so let's take a five minute break and we'll come back at 1140, okay? That way everyone can get a drink, use the restroom, do whatever, and then we'll come back. Don't hit unrecord though. <laughs> All right, setting a timer, we'll be back at 1140.
All right. Yes, Esme, I'm going to go over math. Okay. Okay, hopefully everyone is on. Okay, so hereditary or genetic. So some genetic disorders result when a child inherits a bad gene from both parents. Other genetic disorders result from a bad gene that is inherited from only one parent. So it depends on the illness, um, whether it's going to take uh, genes from both parents or whether it can just be a gene from one parent. Um, so degenerative diseases, these break down uh, tissues in any system. So degenerative disease can occur due to hereditary infection, injury, substance abuse, or unknown causes. So degenerative, degenerative, bleh, degenerative disease of the knee or back from injury or overuse or just wearing out. And uh, there's also a disease called Tay-Sachs. Um, it's a rare inherited neuromuscular disorder. It lacks an enzyme, and the gene is inherited from both parents. So that's an example. Um, it causes neurologic uh, degenerative uh, issues. Okay, so nutritional disorders. So these are disorders that are caused by imbalance of nutrients in the body, either too much or too little at certain times. Dietary excess in our country are also common. So mostly caloric intake is excessive, which is causing obesity and obesity-related obesity chronic diseases. Um, also, there's metabolic disorders, which cause disruption in the cellular metabolism, so the way that our cells work. So many metabolic disorders are caused by inborn errors of metabolism. So uh, many others can be acquired by disrupted cellular metabolism due to hormonal imbalances brought on by unhealthy dietary and sedentary lifestyles, like, for example, type 2 diabetes. Um, so another example of a metabolic disorder is diabetes, which is a disorder of glucose metabolism. So the body cannot utilize glucose the way it's supposed to. Um, so diabetes does not seem to be inherited in a simple pattern, but people are predisposed to it. So most type 1s have inherited risk from both parents, according to the American Diabetes Association. And then we talked a little bit about PKU, right? Uh, the fetoketoconuria. And so this is a deficiency in the enzyme to break down the amino acids passed down from both parents as, in order for them to have it. And it's due to that lack of enzyme, and then that can cause brain damage. So diseases, so immune system disorders. So most inherited disorders of immunity include autoimmune disorders where the white blood cells start attack attacking certain body tissues as if they were foreign bodies. So even our healthy tissues, um, the body recognizes them as foreign and starts attacking it. So examples would be autoimmune disorders like lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, multiple sclerosis. Um, acquired immune disorders, so they may have infections that attack the immune cells. So one of the ones that we're aware of is the human immunodeficiency virus or HIV. So other disorders of the immune system include allergies where the immune system overacts in response to the presence of a certain peptide. So um, that would be an example of people that have like anaphylactic shock, from being exposed to certain things that their bodies have built up antibodies to and their body overreacts to that. So like bee stings, certain medications, things like that. Then we have uh, cancers. 
So cancer and tumors. So some cancers may be inherited, such as some types of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So you've probably heard of like the BRCA uh, gene. So if you have that, um, it poses a risk for you developing breast cancer. However, many types of cancers are acquired due to mutations in genes that control the cell cycle apoptosis. So apoptosis is defined as programmable cell death. So it's like a cellular suicide. Um, so in our bodies, our cells can divide, um, but it re reaches a point to where it's unhealthy for that cell to divide any longer. We're gonna learn more about that later. And so when that happens, the cells are programmed to go through apoptosis where it will eventually die and it will no longer be able to reproduce. And so um, if the cell does not have apoptosis and it continues to divide indefinitely, um, those cells can turn into cancer cells. And um, so cancer cells never go under apoptosis, therefore they are immortal, which means they don't ever die, they keep dividing indefinitely. So a sample, for, uh, a sample from a mass of suspicious cells is called a biopsy. So if we have overgrowth of tissues, we usually will take a sample of the tissue and look at it under the microscope and check the cell's morphology. So morphology is the way that the cell looks. Because remember, we learned that cells um, or tissues, they take on very similar forms to whatever their function is. So if I were to take a, a sample from my liver, I should be able to identify that those cells came from my liver. If it was from my kidneys, I should be able to identify that it came from my kidneys. So dysplasia, this is abnormal growth or development of cells and tissues. The higher the dysplasia degree means the more abnormal and closer to the cancer cells it is. So like for women, we can have dysplasia on our cervix. So we go and we get um, a pap smear every year, or not every year now, it's every three years now, but it used to be every year. And so what happens is the doctor will scrape um, some of those cervical cells and then they send it to the lab and the lab looks at those cells underneath the microscope. They should look like cervical cells. So when they look at it and they see all of the cells that are in the slide looks like cervical cells, they're not concerned that that patient has cancer. However, if the cells don't, they kind of resemble cervical cells, but there's a little bit of a difference in it, then they may just say that they need to watch it because they identified some abnormal cells. However, if you look at it and it doesn't look anything like a cervical cell or that it, it shouldn't be in that part of the body, then we're concerned that maybe we're dealing with cancer. Um, so psychiatric disorders. So these are disorders of chemical imbalances in the brain. Um, unfortunately, mental illness has a very bad stigma. And so as healthcare providers, it's, us, us to, it's up to us to change the way the world views mental health issues. Um, you know, nobody ever tells the cancer patient you know, you don't need that chemotherapy. You just need to go outside in the sun and get some fresh air. You need a vacation. That'll make you feel better. You just need to eat healthier. You don't need that chemotherapy. Nobody ever tells them that or nobody tells the diabetic, uh, you just, you know, you just need to will your body to, to get up every morning and make that insulin so that your body can utilize sugar. You know, nobody ever tells them that, but we are quick to tell people that have depression or whatever that, you know, if they don't want to get up in the morning, then you just need to force yourself to get up in the morning, or you just need to force yourself to go outside and do things. You know, you just need to change the way your mind thinks and be happy about things. It doesn't work that way. And so we have to make sure that we're changing that stigma. They have a chemical imbalance in their brain, which means that their body is not getting enough of certain um, neuroreceptors. And so we have to make sure um, that are neurotransmitters, sorry, it's neurotransmitters that attach to the neuroreceptors. So either they have a deficiency within their neuroreceptors where they're able to take in those neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, things like that, or their body doesn't produce enough of it. And so we have to change the way people think about it. You know, we shouldn't be making people feel bad if they need mental health help, whether that's medication, whether that's um, behavioral modification, whether it's just psychotherapy. Okay, so infectious disease. This is caused by microorganisms. Um, so this can be um, things like bacteria, viruses, parasites, worms, ticks. 
um, there can be certain predisposing factors that increase the risks for certain diseases, like somebody's age, their gender, their uh, hereditary, their social economic status, uh, living conditions and habits, emotional disturbances, physical and chemical damage, or pre-existing illnesses. All of those can predispose people to being more susceptible to infection. Um, socioeconomic uh, issues are huge. Um, you may have a uh, two elderly couple that uh, are on a fixed income. They're, they may have Medicare or they may be getting Social Security, but they don't get a lot of money. And with Medicare, sometimes prescriptions are not covered or they're still pretty expensive for them. And when you're on a fixed income, that could be very difficult. So you might have a couple that comes to the clinic and the husband's blood, sh blood pressure is super elevated. And then upon gathering history and information from those patients, you find out that the husband and the wife take the same prescription, but they can only afford to buy one prescription. So one takes one pill one day and then another one takes the pill the next day because they don't have enough money to afford their prescriptions. You might have a single mom that doesn't have anybody to help them and they have to choose whether they're going to go to work or take their baby to the hot, to the doctor for their asthma. And if they don't go to work, they may lose their job. And if they lose their job, then they won't have insurance to help pay for things. And so then you have this mom that has to take their babies to the hospital to get treated for something like asthma because it's the only thing that's open when she's not at work. And so now instead of getting continuity of care by seeing the same provider every day, they're seeing different providers and different ER doctors every time there's an issue. And then instead of having something that prevents them from having asthma issues, now we're treating them in a crisis. And so it just becomes a vicious cycle. Um, and so that can be problematic too for people um, that are in those particular types of situation and having access to that particular type of health care. Um, living conditions, sometimes people can't afford to live in the best of places, and so that can affect the way that they live as well. Maybe living in a very uh, urban city and uh, they live in an older building, has lead pipes, predisposes their child to lead poisoning, or maybe they don't have running water, maybe they live in a tent. So um, those types of things can affect how people um, develop illness too. Uh, people that are like in prison, right? Very close quarters, sleeping very close together, things like tuberculosis, things like scabies, those things can spread very quickly in an environment like that because there's a lot of people being housed in a very small confined um, quarters. And so those are things that can predispose people to microorganisms that can make them sick. Okay, so disease terminology, you guys should know each and every one of these uh, uh, def by definition. Um, so etiology, uh, this is a study of a cause of a disease. So what causes the disease? So if somebody has cirrhosis of the liver, then the etiology may be from alcoholism, or it could be just related to some like hepatitis or something to that effect. But the etiology is what is causing the liver failure or the cirrhosis. Um, the other one is incidence. So the incidence is the rate of new cases of a disease, when, where, and how often it occurs. So um, that could be something like diabetes, right? It's not a new disease. However, there may be new cases that are um, that are happening due to our lifestyles. Um, and so the rate of those new cases would be the incidence. Okay, um, acute, this is something that has happened within the last three months. So um, someone falls and breaks their arm, that's an acute injury. Um, if someone has uh, acute liver failure, that means their liver, liver failed within that three months. Um, or chronic, chronic is something that lasts longer than three months. So people that have things like rheumatoid arthritis or conditions that can last longer than three months, we call those chronic conditions. Um, then there's a term called idiopathic. So idiopathic means we don't really understand where the disease comes from. Um, so like for example, type one diabetes, we don't really understand for sure how it, um, certain people are more predisposed to it than others. Um, and so if we don't know what the cause is, then we would say that it's idiopathic. 
So itrogenic. So itrogenic is disease from an adverse effect of treatment. So itra means physician. So it means it was caused by the physician. Now that doesn't, I mean, itrogenic could be that you go in to have an amputation of your right leg and they accidentally amputate the left leg. That's itrogenic, okay? But itrogenic doesn't mean that the doctor is always doing something wrong. So for example, a patient has breast cancer, the doctor puts them on chemotherapy, their hair falls out. Nobody wants their hair to fall out. That's an, un, that's an unwanted effect from a treatment. It's itrogenic, but it doesn't mean that the doctor did something wrong because the patient needs the chemotherapy to get, to get better, but it does have an adverse effect. Nausea from the chemotherapy, that is an itrogenic effect. Nobody wants to be nauseous, but unfortunately it's part of uh, the side effects from that medication. Then we have communicable disease. So communicable disease means it's transmitted from person to person. Um, epidemic. So this is many people acquiring a certain disease at the same time. A uh, pandemic is a larger region, like the COVID-19 that we're experiencing right now is a pandemic. It's a disease that's affecting a large region across the world. Um, nosocomial infections. So nosocomial infections are caused by hospitalization or they're acquired at a clinical institution. So for example, grandma goes in because she fell and broke her hip at home and she needs surgery. So she goes to the hospital. While in the hospital, grandma develops MRSA or MRSA, or grandma's taking antibiotics because she has pneumonia and all of a sudden now she has C. diff. She didn't have it when she came to the hospital. She didn't have C. diff when she came to the hospital, or she didn't have MRSA when she came to the hospital, but she acquired it while she was there. Or they went to the doctors, didn't have it before, they acquired it when they were there. That's a nosocomial infection. Um, it's really important that we prevent nosocomial infections because the way things are paid now through the Affordable Health Care Act is that if a patient comes and contracts a nosocomial infection, then insurances do not have to pay for that hospitalization. So indirectly, that affects you as a healthcare worker because you are not going to, the hospital's not gonna make as much money, which means you may not get your raise or um, you may not be making as much as you normally could be making. So sign, sign is an objective evidence of disease. So objective means that we can measure it or other people can see it. Um, so vital signs, like I can assess a person's temperature, right? That is a sign. If, the, if I take their temperature and their uh, temperature is elevated to 102.3, I can measure the temperature, okay? Um, if somebody says, um, so let me move on to the next one and then I'll go over that, but symptoms. So this is subjective. So this is what someone's describing to us. A patient is describing, I can't see it. Okay, so subjective evidence of a disease. This is something that is reported by the patient because only the patient can feel it. So for example, patient says they feel nauseous. Okay, that's a symptom. Patient vomits that's a sign because I can see the vomitus, I can measure the vomitus, okay? Um, patient tells you they're in pain, that's, that's a symptom, okay? Um, bone sticking out of their leg, that is a sign, okay, that they have a broken leg. However, pain, even though it is a symptom and it is subjective, in the nursing world, in the healthcare world, we do treat it objectively because we provide a pain scale right? We say zero out of 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever had, and then zero being no pain at all, okay? So even though it is subjective, we can't feel it, we treat it objectively because we use the pain scale. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes, make sure I went over everything. Okay. 
I heard a ding. I don't know if someone posted something in the comments. I can't see the comment section when I'm in my PowerPoint. So if you have a question, you got to make sure that you turn your mic on and that you ask the question, okay? Um, so disease, infectious disease. This is caused by disease producing organisms. Um, so modes of transmission of infection. So direct contact. So you, you're touching that person, shaking that, per, uh, that person's hand, kissing them or having sex with them. That's a direct contact. Okay, indirect is things like airborne. So I cough and I put these droplets in the air. You come in and you breathe in the air. You didn't have contact with me. It was indirect. A fomite. So a fomite is an, is an object. I cough on my hand and then I touch the door handle. Later you touch the door handle. You rub your eyes, your nose, your mouth. You've become infected indirectly because you didn't come in contact with me, but an object that I did touch, which is indirect, okay? Vector, so vector is an insect or an animal that transmits organisms from one host to another. So like a mosquito, right? Mosquito can um, indirectly affect us from another person. They bite a person or an animal that has malaria or Zika, right? And then they bite somebody else that person's been indirectly affected by that vector, okay? So portals of entry, this is another way that we become sick is how things enter into our body. So for example, our skin, that is our number one barrier in protection against pathogens. If it has a, a physical and a chemical barrier because our skin is uh, slightly um, acidic. So uh, B, the respiratory tract, we can breathe in the, uh, the germs, right? And then digestive tract, if we consume something that's uh, infected with a virus or a bacteria, we can become sick that way. Urinary tract, so like people have Foley's, right? That's a, or a catheter, right? The tube that's placed inside of a patient's bladder. If it's not taken care of properly, then we can, uh, if the person can develop a urinary tract infection. Also sex, having sex, especially for females, they're at risk for developing urinary tract infections because the flora from uh, the penis and also the vaginal tract can enter into the urinary tract and cause a UTI. Um, reproductive uh, systems, we can um, develop things like HIV, herpes, and other sexual transmitted diseases uh, through contact um, um, by uh, intercourse. Okay, so um, I don't think there was a slide. Let me go. Let me go back. I feel like we missed where we talked about primary. Okay, so on page twenty-three at the top, it talks about primary disease prevention. We kind of went over this a little bit before. We just want to review it. So primary disease prevention is choosing a lifestyle that reduces risks of acquiring a disease. So you don't have any risk factors, but you're going to do something healthy to make sure that you don't ever. Um, have to be concerned that that is a risk, like eating healthy or exercising. So secondary disease prevention is getting regular checkups in order to catch disease in its earliest stages and reverse it before it becomes serious. So that's like um, an example would be you go to the doctor and they take labs and your um, cholesterol is high. You don't have coronary artery disease yet, but the doctor wants you to uh, change your diet and exercise. That's a secondary disease prevention. Tertiary would be that you actually have coronary artery disease and you're needing some sort of a treatment from the physician. Okay, so let's do our practice questions on 24. So number one says Tay-Sachs disease most likely falls in this category. So the, it's actually C, it's a genetic disorder. So you have to receive it from your parents. Infectious disease is acquired at Infectious disease acquired at a clinical institution that would be called nosocomial. A study of the cause of the disease is etiology. So when a medication causes an unpleasant side effect such as nausea, this symptom would be called, um, and it's itrogenic, because itrogenic are adverse effects from treatment of a physician. Approximately one-third of Americans are considered overweight and obese. This statement is about Prevalence. Remember, incidence is about new cases. So here we're talking about prevalence. So prevalence is on page 22, in case you need to refer back to that. 
So catching a disease in its earliest stages by getting regular checkups, that is an example of secondary disease prevention. And then nausea is an example of a symptom because we can't feel it, only the patient can feel it and verbalize it to us. Okay, so now I have my review questions. So what does itrogenic mean? So itrogenic is the side effect of a medical treatment. So hydrogenic could be common like nausea or it could be a medical error as a result of treatment like uh, amputating the wrong uh, extremity. So which of the following is a sign? Okay, so which of the following is a sign? Um, a fever, um, can I measure that? Swelling, can I measure that? Redness, can I see that or assess it? A headache. Can I, can I assess that on a patient or itching? So the answer would be one, two, and three. I can't feel the patient's headache to assess it. And itching is a symptom, a rash is a sign, okay? So what is ATP composed of? Okay, so remember ATP, if you think of what adenosine is made up of, which is adenine and a ribose, Okay, then you have to think about these, each one of these. Can adenosine triphosphate be adenine, ribose, and three phosphates? Yes, it can, because if you remember, adenine and ribose are adenosine. Okay, can it be adenosine and three phosphates? Yes, it can. Can it be adenosine deoxyribose? It can't be deoxyribose because it has to have a ribose, okay? Adenosine diphosphate only? No, because this has a triphosphate. There's two, right? So the answer is gonna be both one and two. Okay. All right, so we're going to go ahead and I'm going to show you guys now how to do your math. I have to switch my screen really quick. Okay, so I kind of, I, I did it yesterday for some students, so that we're having questions. So number one, uh, I have way more examples than you do on your practice questions. I don't even think I have the homework, hold on. All right, um, what I think I'm gonna do, actually, let me delete this. Um, I think I'm gonna go over your practice questions. So if you guys have your packets on page, twenty six, there's practice questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and do the practice questions with you. So remember, um, I tend to use dimensional analysis because I feel like it's the easiest to do unit conversions. So for your math tests, 
in the future. Um, and you can highlight these on page uh, 26, but you want to memorize these ones. I'm going to tell you which ones you need to memorize, okay? You need to memorize that one kilogram is 1,000 grams, and that one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams. And you want to memorize that one milligram is equal to 1,000 micrograms. And then that's pretty much all you need to know for your midterm and your final are these ones right here, okay? The other thing you want to know is that one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds, which you guys should already know that one because you've already done math for that. So these are the conversions we're going to use when we're doing these problems right now. Um, so when you're doing conversions, right, this right here, I can write it in a fraction. I can write that one kilogram is a thousand grams or I can write a thousand grams is going to be one kilogram. It's the same thing because these, if I measure, if I were to measure the amount of a substance and it was one kilogram, it would be the same amount for one gram. It's just that we're using different units. Like for example, if I have one hour, that's the same as 60 minutes. It's not any difference or 60 minutes over one hour. It's still the same thing. It's still the same amount of time. If you divide this into this, you get one. If you divide this into this, you get one. It's the same thing. The reason why I have to understand that I can write it both ways is because when we use dimensional analysis, we have to use the unit that is in the numerator on for the number that we're solving for that's on the left side of the equation, okay? So you guys have that, um, uh, what do you call it, the unit conversion. You guys have that on... Uh, page 26, okay? So the first problem says that it's 235 milligrams, and then it wants you to know how many grams is that, okay? So remember the first part of, um, you know what I wanna do, hold on a second, I'm gonna, I want to move my Google meeting over here in case you guys ask me questions, hold on. Yes, you need to memorize how many centimeters are in an inch. That's it, okay? Okay, so now remember the first thing that we do with dimensional analysis is we look at what we're solving for. So we're solving, solving for grams, okay? Now because I know that I'm solving for grams right here, okay, remember that I have to put grams here because whatever unit is here has to be in the numerators here. So knowing that, I have to look at how I can get from grams to milligrams. So I know that one gram is equal to 1,000 milligrams, okay? Or even if I had 1,000 milligrams is equal to one gram, I just know I have to put the gram in first. So one gram is 1,000 milligrams, okay? Now, the second part of my dimensional analysis is that whatever unit is in the denominator here, I have to be able to cancel it out here. So I know that this has to be milligrams, okay? That's where this comes in, okay? So as soon as you get the unit that you need right here and it's the unit you're solving for, that's what you want to plug in right here. So now I have 235 milligrams over one. And I'm just putting my one there to hold a place value. Okay, now the next part is that I need to cross cancel my like units, right? So I can cross out milligrams and I can cross out milligrams here. The next part is that I'm gonna multiply the top. So then I get 235, okay? And then I'm gonna multiply the bottom across. So then I get 1,000, okay? And also, I can check to make sure that I set this up correctly because I have grams here and I have grams right here. Okay, so that tells me that I set it up correctly. So I should, on this side of the equal sign, I should only have the units left that I'm solving for on this side of the equal sign. That tells me I set my problem up correctly. 
Okay, so now to answer this right here, there's two ways that you can do this. You can count your zeros, one, two, three, and if you have your decimal here, then you would just move it one, two, three, because my number should get smaller because I'm dividing, okay? Then you end up with 0 0.235 grams. If you can't do that, then you put the top number into the calculator first, and then you divide it by the bottom number and you'll get the right answer, okay? So any questions on this one? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next one. So the next one on the practice questions on page 26 is 2.5 milligrams. Um, and that is into micrograms. So I want to know how many micrograms. So the first thing that I do is I look at what my units are, and then I look at my chart, right, that tells me what my conversions are. So my choice is one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams, or one gram is equal to a thousand milligrams, or I have one milligram is equal to a thousand micrograms. So I'm looking for something that has milligrams and micrograms in it. So that would be this one right here, right? Because it has milligrams and micrograms. Now, when I set up my problem, I'm going to write first what I'm solving for. And I'm solving for micrograms. And then I know that whatever is in the numerator here, because this is the same thing as saying micrograms over one, is that unit has to be in the very first spot that we're solving for. So now that I know that this is micrograms, then I just plug this in, making sure that I put the micrograms on top. So there's a thousand micrograms here, and that's equal to one milligram. Um, this has to stay. This has to stay together as how it's written. I can't swap the thousand and put a thousand milligrams and then one microgram. That doesn't work. It has to. It has to be just like this. One milligram is equal to a thousand micrograms. Okay, so now whatever is in the denominator here has to be in the numerator here because I need to be able to cancel these two out. So now I'm going to look at my problem and see, do I have a milligram here? Yes, I do. So I can plug that in right here. So 2.5 milligrams. Okay, so now that I have this set up, um, then I'm going to next cancel out my like units. Okay. So my like units are milligrams, okay? The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check whatever I have here should be the only units that I have left over on the opposite side of the equal sign, which it is. So that tells me that I set my problem up. So not only are we looking to see are these the same units, they both have to be in the same area. Like this has, if this is in the numerator, then that unit would have to be in the numerator on this side, okay? So now then you will multiply across your 1,000 times your 2.5, and then you could put one underneath there for your place value if you need it, and then you're going to multiply your uh, numbers down at the bottom, okay? So this would be 1,000 times 2.5, and this would be 1 times 1, so that would be 1. Now, you can multiply this. I know my number is going to get bigger, right, because I'm multiplying. You can also count your zeros, one, two, three, and then you just move this three spaces, one, two, three. Wherever there's a little whoop, right, you add a zero, okay? So 2,500, or it's 2,500 micrograms. That's your answer. Okay, any questions on this one before I move to the next one? Okay, so <clears throat> I'm glad it makes sense, Misha. I know it can be challenging. Math is not my favorite subject either. So, all right, um, number three says 0 0.25. 
and milligrams, and we want to get to micrograms. Okay, so again, looking at our conversion, so one kilogram is a thousand grams. Oops, a thousand grams. And then one gram is equal to a thousand milligrams. And then one milligram is a thousand micrograms. Okay, so what unit am I going to set up first? So go ahead and type in the comment box. When I'm setting my dimensional analysis up, how do I know what I'm going to, yes, we're going to put micrograms. It's whatever we're solving for. Good. Okay, now, what unit is going to go in my numerator right here? Yes, it's going to be micrograms, right? It has to be the same as what's here because this is in the numerator here, so it has to be here, okay? So now that I know that this is micrograms, am I going to use number one, number two, or number three to solve my problem? Yes, I'm going to use number three. So what number do I plug in here? If I'm using number three, what number? Yes, I'm going to put my thousands here over. And then what's going to be down here? One apple, one orange. Yeah, good. Make sure you keep your units one milligram, right? So I'm using this one right here because it has milligrams and micrograms, and that's what I'm solving for, okay? Now... This is milligrams, so what unit has to go right here? Milligrams, good. So now that I know this is milligrams, what am I going to plug in right here? The 0 0.25 over 1, okay? Now I can take the milligram here and milligram here and cancel it out. And then you can multiply across on the top. Um, or, or before you do that, you could make sure that you have the same units on each side, right, in the same area, so you can make sure you set it up right. Then you can multiply this across, so you would have 1,000 times 0 0.25, and then 1 times 1. And you can multiply this out, but I know my number is going to get bigger, and in order for my number to get bigger, my decimal would move this way, right? So 1, 2, 3, and I could go 1 two, and then wherever you have a little whoop and not a number there, you add your little zero, okay? And you have to do it with a sound effect or it's wrong. Just kidding. Okay. So that would be your answer, okay? All right. Any questions on that one? All right. I'm assuming no news is good news. Okay. Oh. I hear something. Someone have a question? Nope. Okay. So the next one is on your practice is a hundred and or 1,235 milligrams. And we want to know how many grams that is. Okay. So what am I going to start my problem with? With grams. <clears throat> Oh, Levy, I already erased it, honey. I'm sorry. I can go back and do it later. Remind me, and I'll put it back up on the board, okay? All right, so grams, right? And then what unit is going to go here? It's not going to be milligrams. It has to be what's right here. Grams. Yeah, it has to be grams. Whatever, so... Whatever's on this side of the equal sign has to be the same on this one, on this side. So if this is grams, this has to be grams too. Okay, so now knowing that, right, we have our little conversion chart over here. Okay, so am I going to use number one, two, or three to plug in here? Number two, right? So what number do I put right here? Number two. 
Yes, so I'm going to put one, and then what number is going to go down here? Yes, 1,000 milligrams, right? Because if we're using this, we have to keep the same units together, okay? Now, this is milligrams here, so what unit goes here? Yes, milligrams. So knowing this is milligrams, do I plug in something here, or am I plugging in this right here? Yes, we're going to plug in the 1,235 milligrams over 1. And that 1 is just to hold the place value, right? And then we can cross out our like terms, make sure we have the same units on each side, that they're both in the same area, which they are. They're both in the numerator. Then I can multiply this across the top and you can multiply this across the bottom. So you don't have to do the extra step where you write one times whatever if you don't want to. I was just doing that for those people that are just getting used to doing this. Okay, so then you have 1,235 over 1,000, right? So the other trick is when you're dividing, you count the zeros, one, two, three, you use your decimal, the number should get smaller because we're dividing one, two, three. So you have 1.235 grams as your answer. Okay, any questions on this one? All right, can I erase it? <laughs> If you need me to not erase it, make sure you let me know in the comments. Okay, I'm assuming it's good to erase. All right, so the next one is five, which is 0 0.155, and that's kilograms, and we wanna know how many grams that is, okay? So, um, I'm going to solve for grams, okay? What goes right here? Yes, it's going to be grams, okay? Looking at your conversion chart, what number am I going to put right here? So your conversion chart is the uh, one kilogram is a thousand grams, one gram is a thousand milligrams, one milligram is a thousand micrograms. Okay, so what do I plug in right here? Yes, we're going to plug in a thousand, right, because we're going to use this one, right, because this one has grams and this one has kilograms, grams and kilograms. So I have a conversion that has both those units in it, so I'm going to use that. Okay, so what goes down here? Okay, bye Daisy. Yeah, so it's one and then specifically kilograms, right? Because we're going to keep these units together. Okay, and then what unit is going to go here now? Kilograms. Okay, so what do I plug in right here? Okay, bye Misha. Yes. Um, so you guys make sure when you have a decimal that you put the zero in front of it. Because if you just put 0.155, someone might misread it as 155. And when we're giving medication, we don't want to over medicate our patients. Okay. So always preceding zeros, but no trailing zeros. Okay. And then what goes down right here? Good, just a one, right? Because we're just holding our place value. Then we can cross out our kilograms. Then you can multiply the top across and you can multiply the bottom across. And then you would end up with a thousand grams times 0 0.155. And then one times one. And then one, two, three. My number should get bigger because I'm multiplying one, two, three. So you have 155 grams. Okay, um, any questions on that one? All 
All right. Um, I'm going to jump down now because we've done these examples before. So I'm going to jump down to number eight. Okay. So number eight is 2,500 grams, right? And we want to know how many pounds this is. So our conversion is one kilogram is 1,000 grams. And that one gram is 1,000 micrograms. And one milligram is a thousand micrograms. Okay, but we have pounds here. We don't have pounds over here. So can someone think of a conversion I can use? What conversion can I use for pounds that I do know? Yes, we can use kilograms to pounds, right? One kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds, okay? So I'm solving for pounds here. What unit goes right here? It has to be the same as what's over here. Yes, it's gonna be pounds, right? So now, am I gonna use one, two, three, or four? Yes, we're gonna use number four. So what number do I put right here? Yes, 2.2, what goes down here? Including the unit, what goes down here? Yes, one kilogram, okay? So I use that one, okay? What unit's gonna go right here? Yes, kilograms, okay? So am I gonna use one, two, or three to plug in a conversion right here? Yes, we're gonna use one, good. So what number goes right here? Yes, number one, what goes down here? Yes, a thousand grams, right? So we're gonna use this one, okay? Now, what unit goes right here? Yes, it's gonna be grams, right? Because I have to be able to cancel this out. I only wanna have pounds left over, so I have to get rid of this grams right here. So what do I plug in right here? Yes, 2,500 grams. And what goes down here? Just one, right? Because we're just holding the place value, okay? So now what do I do? Yes, we're gonna cross out our like terms, so our kilograms and our grams, right? And then we're gonna multiply the top across, and then we'll multiply the bottom across, right? So here we have 2.2 times one times 2,500 over one times 1,000 times one, okay? Okay, so now if I get my handy dandy calculator because I don't do math in my head, I'm not one to do that. You're gonna multiply 2.2 times one times 2,500 and you get 5,500. And then one times 1,000 times 1,000 is 1,000. So now what you can do is however many zeros you have down here, right, you can, move your decimal to the left because when I divide, it should get smaller, right? So one, two, three. So then you have 5.5 .5 pounds. That's your answer. Good job. All right. Yes, you are allowed to use calculators, Kayleen, on your midterm and your finals. We provide the, when you're in class, we provide the calculators for you. Or I don't know if you guys noticed, there's a new thing in the computer. Uh, it's like a proctor uh, app. So eventually we'll start using the proctor where it monitors you when you're taking your quizzes. But there's a calculator that we can install. 
So you guys will be able to use the calculator on the computer. All right. Um, any other questions regarding math? Is anyone getting comfortable with dimensional analysis? People are probably like, I don't want to say, I don't know yet. <laughs> All right. Do you want me to do a uh, number nine and then I'll let you go? I know, Amanda, I'm telling you, dimensional analysis is my best friend. I hate math. Okay. Let's do number nine. Okay, so number nine is 0 0.02 pounds, and we want to know how many milligrams that is, okay? So just looking at this problem, I have pounds and milligrams. What conversions do you think I'm going to need? I have pounds, so what's the only conversion I know I can use with pounds right now? Yes, the kilograms, right? So one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds, okay? But I need to get to kilograms all the way to micrograms, okay? So how can, what else can I use to get from kilograms to milligrams? So... Can I say that one kilogram is a thousand grams and that one gram is a thousand milligrams, right? Because these will cancel, right? And these will cancel. And then this is going to cancel with this up here, right? And then I'll be left over with milligrams. Okay. Yep, Amy, you're right. One kilogram is a thousand grams. And then we just have to get from grams. To milligrams, right? We started with kilo, we went from pounds to kilograms, and we're going to go from kilograms to grams, and then grams to grams to micrograms or milligrams, not micrograms. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with our milligrams here. Okay. And then looking at our conversions here, and we know this is going to be milligrams. Which one am I plugging in here first? One, two, or three? Yes, three, right? So I'm going to put my 1,000 milligrams here and our one gram here. Because remember, whatever number is with this unit has to stay with it, right? I can't put I can't put 1,000 grams is equal to one milligram. You can't do that. It, it changes the whole meaning, okay? It has to, you have to keep those numbers together, okay? Now we know that if this is grams, this has to be grams up here, okay? So I already used that one. So am I using one or two? Two, right? So now I can put my 1,000 grams over one kilogram. And then this is kilograms. So this has to be kilograms, right? I only have one conversion left. So one kilogram, 2.2 pounds. And then now this is going to be pounds, and that's where I plug this in, right? 0 0.02 pounds over 1, okay? And then you just cancel your grams, cancel your kilograms, cancel your pounds, and then you can multiply the top across, which is 1,000 times 1,000 times 1 times 0 0.02. I have no idea what just happened with my computer right there. Sorry. Okay, and then you have 1 times 1 times 2.2 times 1, okay? So you can, you can multiply this across, or you could say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then you just count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Remember, wherever there's a little whoop, right, you add a 0, okay? So then you would have 20... 1,000 over 2.2. 2. 1, 
two, three, four, five, six. And then you have 9,090.90. We're going to round to the nearest tenth, so we'll say 90.9 milligrams. Okay. Yes, good job. Good job, guys. All right. So it's I have a little cheat sheet that I'm going to show you guys really quick to try to help with some of this. Um, Cause I'm kind of a person where I don't do very well unless I see it. You can talk about it with me, but I'm not an auditory learner. Okay. So if I'm going from kilograms to grams, is my number going to get smaller or bigger? Right. If you think about it, one kilogram is equal to a thousand grams. Right. So when I'm converting from kilograms, like if I have two kilograms and I want to know how many grams that is, I know that it's going to be bigger than this number because there's a thousand grams in one kilogram. So the number should get bigger when I convert it. Right. If I'm going from kilograms to grams, the number should get bigger. Because if I have two kilograms here, that means I have 2,000 grams. So the number gets bigger, right? It's bigger. Okay. Then if I go from grams to kilograms, right? If I had 2,000 grams and I want to know how many kilograms that is, if there's 1,000 grams in one kilogram, right? The number for kilograms should be smaller than what it is for grams, right? It would be two kilograms. So the number should get smaller. Okay. Then if I'm going from grams to milligrams, the number should get, should it get bigger or smaller? Yes, it's going to get bigger. Okay. Then if I go from milligrams to grams, my number should get smaller, right? Because for one gram, there's a thousand milligrams. So if I'm going from milligrams to grams, the number should be smaller. Okay. Then if I'm going from milligrams to micrograms, the number should get bigger again, right? Because one milligram is equal to a thousand micrograms. So when I'm converting from milligrams to micrograms, I would anticipate that the number would get bigger. And if I'm going from micrograms to milligrams, the number should get smaller. Okay. If I'm going from kilograms to pounds, the number should get bigger. If I'm going from pounds to kilograms, the number gets smaller. Okay. Now, the other thing that you want to know is if you're using my little decimal trick, right? The decimal trick. When you're dividing, right? Your decimal moves to the left because it should get the number should get smaller when you divide right and when you're multiplying you're going to move your decimal right your decimals here you're going to move your decimal to the right because your number should get bigger okay and you just count however many you count the zeros right so if um i'm multiplying this times 0 0.2 then i count the zeros over here one, two, three, and then I move this one, two, three, okay? Or if I have two and I'm dividing by a thousand, count your zeros, one, two, three, you move your decimal to the left, one, two, three, right? So you'd have zero, zero, point two, okay? 
All right, any questions before I let you guys go? All right, well, good luck studying. Remember you have until Wednesday to take your uh, test, okay? I'm gonna set the, I'm gonna reset the parameters for that. So otherwise you guys are free to go. You don't have any questions. Yeah. I do uh -huh. have a question. I was having trouble signing in on time and you were mentioning something about vocabulary. The vocabulary. Oh, um, for the, on page 22, you'll want to know what the terminologies are for that. Okay. And that's it. You were, you were saying that it's going to be on the test? Yes, there'll be definitions for that. And sometimes it's like matching, like it'll have the word and then you have to find the definition that goes with it. So Yes. If, if, if we're taking the test and we get maybe six out of those um, eight definitions, right? Do we get a little credit for that? You do. I tell my TA to round up. Okay. Yeah, because I'm not going to take okay. points away that you earn. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm not doing too good on the tests. I think I need to slow down, but I do pretty good on the matching. Mm -hmm. So I'm, yeah, I'm just, hoping that. Just really, really carefully because the questions are set up to see if you can pay attention to the details in the question. So yes. I, I always tell my students when you're reading the questions, Put it in your own words to make sure that you understand specifically what the question is asking. And always read every single choice before you answer, even if you think you found the right answer, because sometimes it'll be something like all of the above or both one and two are correct. And so you want to make sure you look at every single option first. Yeah, and I, I have to learn to figure out when the question is letting me answer more than one. Mm hmm answer yeah or i'll get it wrong yeah yeah, yeah. um so and in the practice question sometimes it doesn't tell you that i'm hoping that it would tell you that in the quiz that there's more than one answer it does not Ugh. It, it it'll say something like which of these is correct okay and so if we I'm go to like one we'll get it wrong yeah like when i do when i read the question i just like it lets you click on one, but when it's like multiple, it lets you click on various. So I just click various and if it just switches to one, then it's not. Okay. Oh, okay. There, that's a good way to check. Try clicking another answer just to see if it lets you select it as well. Yes. Yeah, you'll learn yes. your little tricks as you go. <laughs> okay. And as far as extra credit, is uh, that available yet? There's not any extra credit for the residential program because you have a live teacher to work with you. That's only oh. for students that don't have a teacher. They're specifically doing it just strictly on their own. Yeah. Oh, okay. So. Okay. I did see a box for it, but it doesn't pertain to us. Yeah. If it's in Moodle, don't pay attention to what's in Moodle. You need to look at what's on Judgy. Okay. Yeah, okay. So look at the grading components and judgy because that's what we give you credit for. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Is there any other questions, guys? Um, I have a question. Uh huh. Regarding the camera thing, do we have to install it now or later on? Um, I don't have my quizzes set up yet, so I'll let you guys know ahead of time. Uh, when it's going to be available to you guys it should be shortly but um i don't it's not going to be today because i just learned i just took a meeting i just got a training on it this morning so i have to play with it before i set it up okay so i'll let you guys know all right all right any other questions i see someone comment is anyone if anyone needs help with math, oh, thanks, Kayleen. That's nice. And um, do we have to wait for the fifth quiz until Wednesday? Yes. Yeah, so the way that it's going to work now is I will probably open the quiz after I lecture on the content. So I'm going to take away the lectures that are in there now 
So Jolena's lectures, those are going to go away. And then I'm going to be lecturing. Um, so either it'll be a recording of me lecturing the content, or it'll be either shy or I live. So, and we'll email you and let you guys know. So, um, I mean, I can, I'm, I can leave the, the lectures there for Jelena if you want them, and I can leave them the way they are, but you're not required to take them until after I lecture because I want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to ask questions and clarify any of the information um, that's covered in the content. I, I would like to know if you could leave Jelena's videos because I can listen to them in the car yeah. and I mean, other I can, places. I'm just going to make sure. I just don't want them to be a requirement for you to do your practice questions, to do your quizzes, okay. to do your math. So you'll have the option. And um, I'm hoping okay. that I'm going to try to get lectures done because I have to help um, next week with um, clinical. So Cheyenne is going to be the one jumping on for your live discussions. And so I want to make sure you guys have the lectures ahead of time because I don't know if she's going to have time to do a lecture. So you'll at least have my lectures and then you can watch them and then you can ask her questions during the live chat if you have any. All right. Any other questions? I do, uh, Melissa. I have, um, when I log into Jeji, it uh -huh. says that the page is not available and I don't really have any um, information or emails or anything on there. Uh, Are you a late admission? Excuse me? Were you a late admission? I had a few students no. that came in late. In fact, I, I was able to get on at one time. I had to change my password and I was able to get, you know, the grades and everything. But now it says page not found and then... It's really when when I go to the site, it's not. I I just had that same issue right now, and if you if you go to go go to profile and you click that, it'll take you to your go to what? Page. Oh, profile. Yeah, when I click on, it just gives me a little box with. Um, Do you guys know that you can go to Judgy and Moodle? Yeah, that's how I get there is through that the little tab okay. by our picture. You can also go to um, www um, dot judgy dot okay. dot edu. Oh, I'll try that. I'll try yeah. that directly then. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I don't know if you can see my screen, but I have my, I bookmarked them. So they're up here. Oh, so they're okay. to get to them. Okay. Yeah, I, I even thank bookmarked you. your guys' class. So like it, I have a lot of them, but over here I even bookmarked EMB. Because later you'll, when you, when you get into the core program, there's going to be multiple classes in Moodle. So you could set like a bookmark up at the top and then that way you can go directly to that class instead of having to click on all your courses. Because for me, like in Moodle, I set up my bookmarks each time. Because if you look, look at how many access, oh, how much wow. I have. And so it's hard for me to shuffle through all of that. So I just set them up at my bar okay. at the top. So that's an option. Any other questions, guys? Let's see. Um, so Navpri, are you talking about like the medical terminology quizzes or the medical terminology games? Um, so Navpri, there'll probably be a mandatory time on the midterm and the finals because there's not a lecture on that day. And, um, so everyone will have to be doing it at the same time, just for security reasons. And uh, making sure the test isn't compromised. And um, so the medical terminology games you'll find later in the different sections, like the hangman and the uh, crosswords and stuff like that. They come up later. You're welcome. All right, any other questions before I let you guys go? I do have a question. Uh-huh. Um, so our lecture for the quiz is not due until next week, correct? We will take it on Wednesday. So lecture four, you'll have till Wednesday to take the quiz. And then okay. you don't have to do lecture five quiz by Thursday because it I'll do the same thing. You'll have until the next class period. Because normally what happens when you're on campus is I would lecture today and you wouldn't take the test until you come back on, is today Thursday? Till you come back on Tuesday. 
right? Then you would take your your lecture for quiz. Um, and then lecture on five, and then Thursday you would come back and you would take your quiz five on Thursday. Okay, but all the homework and everything else is due today. No, um, everything no? is going to be due on the same day because it's too confusing to have things done, due on different days. Okay, so everything will be due on Wednesday. Yeah, and I think I'm going to make a new okay. calendar for you guys so that it'll make more sense. I mean, I probably, I probably could make it due on Tuesday. It's just mm -hmm. easier for me to keep track of things if you turn it in the day before I lecture. But then it, but then if I do that when I lecture on Tuesday, you only have one day. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're. It'll be due on Tuesday, and then Tuesdays will be due on Thursday. Okay. Okay. All right, and I'll and I'll put a calendar out so you guys will um, uh, have an idea of what to do, and you'll you have something to reference. And don't pay attention to the little lecture tabs where it says this is due by midnight because we share the course content with the with the actual online um, people, and their courses meet on Monday and Wednesday. So that's why it was saying it's it was due yesterday because I had a few people emailing me. They're like, "Oh my gosh, why does it say it's due today, but your your calendar says it's due tomorrow?" So go by my calendar, okay? Don't go by what's um, the due dates are in each tab for the lecture. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank okay. You. Uh huh. All right, guys. Um, so this lecture is due on our next lecture, correct? Yes, just making sure, yes. Um, so where is the game quiz? The lecture for science? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay, um... I'm not quite sure what you guys are, are you guys, re when you ask for the game quizzes, are you referring to medical terminology? Thank you, Londra. Have a nice weekend. Um, let me go in here. So, So whatever is in each of these sections, that is what is due. So I think when you get to can't remember if it might be after the midterm that the games show up. Hmm. Well, <laughs> the I'm not familiar as familiar with the new setup as I was before. because they just combined everything. Like I said, it used to be in a separate course. Oh, here it is. So week, so starting week 14, that's when you will see the different things. So like right here, there's a crossword. And then there's like hangman and things like that. So you'll have those to do. Um, I don't remember if, Sorry if I'm making you sick as I scroll, making you motion sick. I can't remember if, um, please, I think it's lecture two. So those are just the book. Okay, I'm 
just going to turn this off just for a second because I don't want people to see other people's grades. Medical terminology, here we go. So what you guys can do, um, and I don't know if they're open, but you can check them out. If you go to your grade section, let me kind of pause this for a second so that way you can't see. Okay, so if you go to your sections under your grade, now your grade book looks a little different than mine, but over on the side, there's this little hamburger guy right here. I call it the hamburger up here that you can click on. Um, and then you can click on your grades right here, or you can go over here and click on grades as well. And then, and then if you are in your class and you click on the grades here, it'll take you. If you use this right here, you'll have to pick the class that it's referring to. Okay. So um, you can actually click. Um, I think yours kind of comes down. Um, actually, I wonder if I can... Um, I think I have a staff member here. No, she's not logged in. Okay. Anyway, but if you click on these links at the at the top, it'll take you directly to that. So um go to if you go to your game section and then just click on the hyperlinks, it'll take you directly to that particular game. Any questions besides that? Um, I'm not sure, Jasmine, why you can't see the the quizzes on Judgy. Um, you have to you have to actually go into your class and then pick grades. Yeah, so when you go into Judgy, you have to select your class, and then you have to right click on it and then pick grades, and then it'll show you your grades. So it's not like right when you log in, it goes right there. Bye, Rebecca. Bye, Kayleen. All right, any other questions before I let you guys go? All right, have a good weekend, guys, and I'll see you on Tuesday. Just keep an eye out for my lectures, Kay, um, to be posted uh, in the Lecture 5 um, section. All right. I'll see you guys later. Have a good day.